So when we talk about the torque, um, we know the torque uh, is calculated by uh, force multiplied by uh, the radius force times radius. So if we have uh, have a rod is a bar and one end is attached on axis, so this is a fixed. And we give a force, a tangential force. And this force is perpendicular to the radius, then this rod is going to spin and the trajectory is a circle. Okay, the spins uh, clockwise or counterclockwise depends on the direction of the force. Okay, then um, because this rod is spinning, so we said the force provides a torque. Uh, this torque um, keeps this rod uh, spinning. And we know the torque is calculated by using the force times the radius. The radius from the axis to the force. That's the radius. Okay, this is uh, the equation we learned from last class. But there's a question. What if the force is not perpendicular to the radius? For example, if I have a force, that force is parallel to the rod. So the force goes to the right, and the force is parallel to the radius. I mean, uh, the parallel means the force is uh, on the horizontal direction, and also the radius is in the horizontal direction. Then you will find that uh, this rod doesn't move. The result is the rod doesn't rotate. Okay, that's the result. That means if the rod doesn't rotate, uh, there's no torque. Torque is zero. So we cannot use this equation. This equation is a case when the force and the radius has a 90 degree in between. So the degree, uh, the angle between the force and the radius is a 90 degree. But if the angle between the force and the radius is zero degree or 180 degree, for example, if I push a force to the left. So these two force, one is pulling, the other is push. Those two force uh, don't give a torque uh, because they are perpendicular to the radius. So that means we need to multiply by a factor depending on this angle. So if we know uh, the factor, for example, the force, times the radius, and we need to time something. That something should be dependent, the angle dependent. Depend. Okay, so what should we do? We know when theta equal to 90 degree, this function equal to one. Okay. The theta function, theta function is equal to one. And when theta equal to zero or 180 degree, the theta function equal to zero. So we need to multiply by a function that give us those special results. So that function is a sine function. Then we get a torque equal to force times radius times sine. Theta is the angle between the force and radius. Okay, this is a general equation. When we calculate the torque, we need to figure out where's the force. The force is on the end of the rod or in the middle. Then when we know the, uh, the location of the force, then we can determine the radius. 
In this case, the radius is the length of the rod. If the force is not at the end, it's in the middle or in the center, then the radius will change. The final thing, we need to figure out uh, the angle between the force and the radius. If they are perpendicular, the theta is 90 degree, then the sine 90 degree is one. But if they are parallel, the angle is zero degree, then the sine zero degree is zero. Okay. If we compare this equation with the definition of the work, we know the work equal to the force times the distance times cosine theta. The theta is angle between the force and displacement. And you can find that these two equations are different. So work says if the theta is 90 degree, then the work is zero. But in the torque, if the theta is 90 degree, the torque goes to the maximum. And the units are different. For the work, the unit is joule. Okay. But for the torque, the unit is Newton times meter. We don't use joule as a unit. So that's different. Uh, okay. So to help you understand how to calculate the torque by using this uh, angle dependent equation, I'm going to uh, show you some examples from the homework. And those examples can help you understand how to calculate the torque. Here, there's a rod. This rod can, uh, one end of the rod is fixed on the axis, that's a point O, and we apply a force on the rod at different position with different angle, then we're going to calculate the torque. First of all, we know the torque has a magnitude of 10 Newton and the length of the rod is four meter. Part A. If the angle between the force and the radius is 90 degree, that's a perfect case. We know the torque equal to the radius times the force times sine theta. In the first part, the r, the radius, is from the axis to the force. Okay, so that's the length of the rod. The radius is four meter and the force is 10 Newton. Angle is 90 degree. So we get 40 Newton meter. That's a torque in the part A, right? Then second part, we have the same radius, same force, but different angle. So the radius is four meter, length of the rod times the magnitude of the force, 10 Newton, and the angle. The angle is 120 degree. So it doesn't matter uh, where the direction of the radius. You can think the radius goes to the right or goes to the left, depends on how you define as uh, the direction of the radius. It doesn't matter because if you pick this angle, that's 120 degree. And if you pick this angle, that's a 60 degree. From the sine function, you will know that sine 120 degree actually equals sine 60 degree. So you don't need to worry about uh, should we pick out 120 degree or 60 degree because we have this relation sine theta equal to sine pi minus theta. That's the relation. So if you see this two vector has angle is 120 degree, then you just put the 120 into the sine function. You will get the same result. Okay, that's part B. Part C. And the force is 10 Newton. Radius is from the axis to the force, as also the length of the rod, that's four meter. And the angle in between is 30 degree, or you can use 150 degree. This is 130, this is 30, this is 150. Doesn't matter. 
they should be the same. So eventually you get 20 Newton meter. That's part C. Okay, those three parts, the force is exerted on the end of the rod. So force is exerted on the inside of the rod. So we have the radius equal to the length of the rod. Then if we go to the part D, you will find the force is not on the end of the rod, it's in the middle, right? For the part D, the force is exerted on the middle point of the rod. So that means the radius is not equal to the length of the rod. So we had to figure out the, the radius. The radius is from the axis to the force here. So that's two meter. R is two meter. And the same thing, torque equal to two meter times the force, 10 Newton times sine 60 degree. Or you can use 120. Then after you do the calculation, uh, eventually you should get the result as 17.3 Newton meter. Part E, um, the force is on the axis. This is axis. So the radius is zero. That means you push a fixed point, then the rod doesn't move. So torque equals to zero. The last part, um, the force is parallel to the rod. So that means the force is pushing the rod. And you will find that if you push the rod in this way, then the axis is going to give you a reaction force. So these two forces are imbalanced. So there's no torque. And because the radius parallel, Force the sine zero degree is zero. Torque equal to zero. And for both E and F, the rod doesn't rotate. Okay. So let me take a pause here. Do you have any question? If you think some part is confused, you can let me know. Okay, if not, I'm going to move to the next question. Um, there is a surface. On the surface, there is a book. There's a book, and this book connect the ways a pulley. Pulley. And on the other side of the cord, there is a counterweight. Counterweight. And both of them just drop down with the speed or with the acceleration. And use the acceleration. Here's the acceleration because the counterweight is heavier than the, than the book. And because they are frictionless, so uh, we don't need to consider the friction. What we know is the pulley has a diameter 
0.150 meter. So that means the radius is 0.075 meter. That's the radius of the pulley. And we also know uh, this book moves 120 meter in just 0.8 seconds. Then we can use this description to calculate the acceleration. Okay. First question, what's the tension? What's the tension in each part of the court? So we're going to calculate the tension of the book, the tension of the book, and the tension on the counterweight. Okay. okay, I got the question, why the tension are not equal? Okay. That's a good question. Because the pulley has acceleration. On the pulley, we have a tension from the book and we have a tension from the counterweight, that's the pulley. Okay. If the tension is massless, then we don't need to uh, consider the acceleration on the, on the pulley. But if they have a mass and this, this pulley has acceleration, then to get the acceleration, there should be a net torque on the pulley. There's a net torque. There's a tension one, there's a tension two. If tension one equal to tension two, then the acceleration is there. Right? But because the pulley has acceleration, has acceleration, and the pulley has mass. Then we will get acceleration does equal to zero and the torque will equal to the net tension T1 minus T2 times the radius. That's a torque. So that's the reason why these two tensions are different. If we have a condition that says um, no mass for the pulley, then we got the, this guy is equal to zero. So that's the reason why we have acceleration because Tension one minus tension two is a net force equal to ma. If mass is not frictionally, is not a massless, we have this doesn't equal to zero. If this is zero, the mass is zero, we neglect the mass, then the tension difference is zero. Then the first tension equal to the second tension. That's why in this case, we have to consider uh, the mass of the pulley and these two tensions are different. Okay, just to explain uh, why these two tensions are different. And okay, let me go back to this question. Uh, what's the tension in each part? For the book, we have three force, weight, normal force. In the vertical direction, uh, there's no acceleration. So these two force are balanced. We only have the tension. So the tension on the book equal to MA the mass of the book times acceleration of the book. And things, the book and the counterweight are contacted by a cord. The cord, each part, they have the same acceleration. So we are going to calculate acceleration by using this condition. Displacement is 1.20 meter in just a point a second, and the initial um, velocity is zero. So we have final velocity equal to initial velocity plus a t. So a will equal to, uh, hold on. Oh no, I, I can't use this equation. I should use a displacement equal to v zero t plus one half a t squared. And we can solve the acceleration. The acceleration 
uh, hold on, what's the acceleration? The acceleration equal to 3.75 meter per second squared. Okay, so that's the acceleration. Then we can calculate the tension. The tension will be equal to the mass of the book. That's two kilogram times 3.75. Then we get uh, 7.5 Newton. That's the tension on the book. Okay, let's check the tension on the counterweight. We have the weight and we have a tension. So the weight minus the tension will equal to MA. A is the same, that's 3.75, and the tension on the counterweight will be equal to the weight minus MA. So that's MG minus MA. Then we get the tension equals equal to 18.2. Then you get that this tension is different from this tension. These two tensions are different. Part B. Uh, what's the moment of inertia of the pulley? To get the moment of inertia, I'm going to go back to this diagram. So here, uh, we have a net tension. Uh, the tension from the counterweight is larger than the tension on the book. From the book. Okay, so that's a net tension. The net tension times the radius is a torque. That's a torque. And we know to calculate the moment of inertia, we can use the torque divided by the acceleration, right? We also know torque equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. Angular acceleration equals to the tangential acceleration divided by the radius. So we have need inertia times A over radius. So we let's combine these two equation. We get the inertia equal to the torque over the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia can also be equal to the difference of the tension. Radius square over the acceleration. That's how we calculate the moment of inertia. So eventually we get the results. That's a 0 0.016 kilogram meters squared. Let me give you a short summary. Um, since the pulley has an acceleration, that means the tension on the pulley are not in balance. So the tension from the book and the tension from the counterweight are different. Um, these tensions are different, so we get a net tension. The net tension will provide a torque on the pulley to keep the rotation of the pulley. And so we use the net tension times the radius, we get the net torque. The torque will give us um, the relation between the inertia and the angular acceleration. So we can use the second equation, this one, to calculate the moment of inertia. So do you have any other question? Okay, if there's no question, I'm going to move to the energy and the work part. So uh, we know in the translation, if there is object under a force and it move a distance L, then the work done by the force is equal to force times distance 
and also times a cosine theta. Um, but if we have a rotation, this is axis, center, and there's a string connected with a mass point. The radius r and the trajectory is a circle. Then we're going to calculate the work if there's a force. If there's a force and the force is perpendicular to the radius. Let's use a special case. Then we know from the traditional way to calculate the force, uh, the work equal to the force times the distance. If the distance of this curve is L, then the work equal to the force times L. But in the circular motion, we know the distance of this curve, the length of this curve could be use the radius times the angular displacement to replace. So we know L equal to R times the theta. Because if we have a circle and we have angle here, we know the radius, the length of this curve is equal to radius times theta. So you can confirm this in the mathematics. Uh, so we're going to replace the displacement with r times theta. So work equal to force times r times theta. And we know force times r is a torque. So work could be written as torque times angular displacement. The reason why we want to use this equation, not the force times L, is um, the force to be changed and the distance to also change. But the torque and the theta is very easy to measure in, in the circular motion. The L is not easy to measure. And the force is also not easy to measure, but the torque could be get a very simple way in the circular motion. So we use torque times theta because this is a convenient equation. Okay, uh, let's talk about the torque for a little bit because the torque could be uh, measured by using the inertia of the moment times angular acceleration. So these two parameters are very easy to measure in the circular motion. So we use these two to get the torque, then we use the torque multiplied by the angular displacement, then we get the work. We also have another question. How fast does the torque do the work. So that's a question about the work rate. How fast? Uh, so we define the work rate equal to the work done by a duration. So we divide by time. That's the work rate. We use work over time. That will get the work rate. And we name the work rate as power. This is the definition of the power. Power is work rate. We use work divided by the time we get the power. And if we want to know the instantaneous power, we can replace the work by using the torque times the angular displacement. So we have angular displacement times the torque divided by time. Then we know angular displacement divided by time is angular velocity. So this could be used torque times angular velocity to get the instantaneous power. This is omega angular uh, velocity. Angular velocity. 
times torque is a power. Then let me give you an example to show how we calculate the work and the power. There is an airplane and has an engine. And the engine has a rod is 2.08 meter long and 117 kilogram mass. Okay. And it says the constant torque is 1950 Newton meter and it starts from the rest. What's the angular acceleration of the of the rod? Okay, that's calculated. Um, we know the torque to get the angular acceleration. We just need to use the torque equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration. The moment of inertia can be found in the table 9.2. From the 9.2, you can find uh, this propeller to be treated as a rod and the axis is through the center. So in this model, the inertia is one cross and length times, uh, hold on, one twelfth mass length square. Length is from the left end to the right end. That's length. Okay, so the angular acceleration equal to torque 1950 Newton over uh, the inertia 1 12 mass is 117 and the length is 2.08 meter square. Okay, so we get the angular acceleration Angular acceleration is equal to 46 per second square. That's angular acceleration. Part B, what's the angular speed after making five revolutions? Okay, we know the angular displacement. In this case, we know theta is five revolution, but the revolution is not a unit for the angular displacement we need to multiply by two pi. That's the angle. And we know the acceleration is 46 meet, uh, second per second, a uh, uh, second square, per second square. And we know it starts from the rest, so the initial x velocity is zero. So to get a final angular velocity, we use the formula omega square equal to initial angular velocity square plus two alpha theta. In this case, we get the angular velocity after five revolution is 54 per second. Okay, that's a part B. Part C, let's see how much work is done by the engine during the first five revolutions. So work equals the torque times displacement, angular displacement. So torque is 1950. The uh, angular displacement is five revolution, like five times two pi. So we get the work, it's very large. Okay, so we get six, times 10 to the four joule. Uh, part C. Part D, what's the average power in the first five revolution? Okay. Part D calculates a power. We know power is the rate of work. We use work over time. And uh, work over time, but we don't know time. Time we have to figure out, but we know final angular velocity. We know initial angular velocity plus angular acceleration time t. So we can solve the time equal to 1 17 second. In this case, we can get uh, the power equal to 6 times 10 to the 4 over T is 170 seconds. Then we get the power. The power 
is 52 times 10 to the 3. The unit is joule per second. Okay, last one. What's the instantaneous power output of the motor at the moment when the uh, propeller has turned through five revolutions? So this is instantaneous. We're going to use the relation power equal to torque times instantaneous uh, angular velocity. Torque, instantaneous angular velocity. Torque is 1950. Instantaneous angular velocity at five revolutions is this one, 54. So we get instantaneous power at six or oh, 60 times 10 to the three geo per second. And it's obvious. This one is larger than the average. So that makes sense. If we just uh, draw a diagram of the angular, angular velocity as a function of time, you'll find that it starts from the rest, then increase. So the power will increase with time. So the average is here. That's the average. And at the five revolution, it end here. That's a five revolution. So you find uh, the average is smaller than the five revolution. Uh, hold on, this is wrong. I'm sorry. Hey, I got the wrong number. So if I take the calculation, I get this is. Uh, one zero five. Okay, that's the correct answer. I just read the wrong number, and so you can find that this is two times of the average. Uh, hold on. Three. Okay. Do you have any other question? Okay, I'm going to move to the last topic, uh, kinetic energy, spinning object. So let's go back to the spinning motion. We have axis here and a string connected with a ball. Mass is M, trajectory is a circle. Then we're going to calculate the kinetic energy. From the traditional way to define the kinetic energy, this is equal to one half mass velocity squared. But in the circular motion, velocity is not a good parameter. We want to use angular velocity. Right? So uh, we're going to replace the velocity by using the angular velocity times the radius. So the kinetic energy could be replaced by one half mass r squared, v squared. Uh, omega squared, omega squared, angular velocity squared. Then you can find that the mass times the radius squared is a moment of inertia. So the kinetic energy has a new way to calculate as one half moment of inertia times omega squared. Omega is angular velocity. The reason we want to use this uh, calculation is that if we have a spinning disk, for example, spinning disk, and the disk at different position, uh, the tangential velocity is different. At the center, tangential velocity is zero. At the on the edge, the tangential velocity is maximum. So if we just track the 
tangential velocity as a function of the radius at the center is zero, then it increases to maximum. But if you just uh, trace the angular velocity as a function of r, the angular velocity is uniform. Any position, the angular velocity is the same, is a constant. Okay, if the angular velocity is a constant, then that's a very good parameter for us to do the calculation. Then if we want to know the kinetic energy of this disk, we don't have to do the integration for any part. We calculate the small kinetic energy by using one over two mv square, then we sum up all the elements. That's very hard. But if the angular velocity is constant, then we can use this parameter to just use one equation, then we get the total kinetic energy. So that's why we want to use this equation, because omega is uniform. But v is not. OK, so we have an example. There is a cylinder, a pulley, and a box. The box falls down and 2.5 meters. And at first, they are, re they are released from the rest. And we want to know after the force, uh, 250 meter, um, what's the velocity of this system? Because there's no friction, right? No friction, so energy conserved. Energy conserve during this motion, the potential energy decrease. Increase because the box drops down, but the kinetic energy increase. Increase. So the decreasing potential energy M box G Y displacement that's the potential energy decreasing during the falling of the box equal to the increase in kinetic energy. The kinetic energy increasing from zero, so the final kinetic energy will be the kinetic energy of the cylinder, kinetic energy of the pulley, and the kinetic energy of the box. So that's the energy conservation. So let's write down the kinetic energy for each element. For the cylinder, it's a rotation. So cylinder give the uh, kinetic energy one half inertia omega cylinder square. Energy of the pulley equal to one half moment of inertia angular velocity of the pulley square. And for the box, the box is moving downward. So that's the translation. We have energy of the box equal to one half mass v square. We know the three elements, cylinder, pulley, and box, are connected by a string or a cord. So they share the same velocity. Have the same velocity. So the velocity of sitting there, uh, the tangential velocity of sitting there equal to the tang tangential velocity of the pulley equal to the moving velocity of the box. And we know the velocity has a relation with angular velocity. That's the angular velocity times the radius. So the energy of the cylinder equal to one half inertia times velocity tangential velocity divided by the radius of the cylinder. That's 40 centimeters. The same thing, one half inertia, then velocity over the radius of the pulley, square. And that's a 20 centimeter. So in this case, we just sum the three parameters we have 
m b g y equals one half inertia v over r c square plus one half v over r p square plus one half mass v square and we just unify all the velocity here so the velocity is what we're going to solve and then we know the mass of the box we know the displacement is 2.50 meter and the inertia could be found in the table and for the cylinder uh, the inertia is how much is the inertia check uh, the inertia will be one half mass times the radius square okay that's the moment of inertia okay so after calculation we get uh, the velocity is equal to 4.76 meter per second you have any other question Okay, if you don't have a question, I'm going to stop this class and um, I will see you on next Tuesday.